My name is Sarah, and I'm the Youth Cannabis Prevention Manager at Public Health Seattle King County, which is the county health department. I usually talk with adults, um, and the reason I usually talk with adults is because a lot of the work I do is around cannabis policy. So my job is um, I don't work one-on-one -on -one with people. I more look at what's happening in King County and Washington State that makes it more or less likely that young people are going to have access to cannabis and that, that cannabis will cause harm for themselves and their family. So it's very exciting to be in a room of young people. And it, uh, I was kind of chuckling to myself when some of you were saying to learn about cannabis because you know what? There's a lot of things that you all know about cannabis, like in your schools, in the circles of young people you know, that I don't know because I am not a teenager. Maybe you guessed that, maybe you didn't. Um, but one of the big parts of my job is actually knowing what's going on for teenagers, for young people in King County, so that when we work on policy, um, it actually makes sense for what the real world situation is. So I know a lot about the cannabis market. Um, I'm gonna talk about, well, I've got an agenda. I'll tell you what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna talk about how, why um, cannabis, which there's a little note down there. When I say cannabis, it means the same thing as marijuana, um, which might be the term that you might be more used to hearing. I'm also gonna talk about THC, which is the chemical in cannabis that has a psychoactive effect, has an effect that changes the way your brain works. Um, you're gonna talk about the health and social risks of cannabis use, and then what youth cannabis looks like, and that's from a data, like a big picture perspective, like who uses cannabis in King County and where does it come from? I'm gonna point out some things that are especially concerning about our current cannabis market, and then talk about supporting youth to be healthy and to not use cannabis. I'm gonna go through this stuff, but if you have questions, if something doesn't make sense, please let me know and I'll clarify it. Or if there's something you wanna add, because like I said, you all have expertise here that I do not have and I would love to hear that tonight and it might help to share it with each other too. Um, we'll pass around the microphone, but if you pop out with something, I can also repeat it so it gets on mic for the recording this way. Have people heard the term THC before as a chemical name for the active component of cannabis, because cannabis is a plant, um, and there's lots of things in that plant, but THC is actually the chemical that interacts with your brain and causes um, what's called a psychoactive effect, or a high. And the reason it works that well is because um, in the plant cannabis, there's the THC, which is very, very similar to chemicals that naturally exist in our brain. It's actually called the endocannabinoid system. There is no test, that's not a vocabulary word. But we have already like receptors in our brain that are basically locks shaped for a certain kind of key. And that key, here's the example on the left of the chemicals that are already existing in our brain, looks a lot like THC. So THC, when it enters our brain from cannabis, can unlock that same receptor in the brain. So here's a very a cartoonish picture of what that kind of looks like. You see THC interacting with the receptor. And one of um, the primary responses to THC engaging with these receptors, neuroreceptors uh, in our brain, they're also in some other parts of our body as well, is to create, it creates a message that releases dopamine. Have folks, have any of you heard of dopamine before? Like in a health class or in a science class, what's dopamine like? Uh, you raise, you raise your hand. Well, I heard of it. But I You've heard of it. Yeah, yeah. Don't need to put you on the spot. Does anybody want to? Does anybody think they know what it is or know it, anything about dopamine? <laughs> yeah. So dopamine leads to addiction, but do you know why? Dopamine can be very addictive. Do you know why? Yeah. It's it's part of what's called the reward pathway in our brain, and dopamine. Um, and I'll say that this presentation is one I give to adults, so this next slide, maybe I'd make different choices of youth, but basically, it's the chocolate cake hormone is one way that I like to talk about it, because it's this, dopamine is a chemical that says the thing you're doing, oh my gosh, it's good, but then the minute you stop doing it, that feeling goes away, and that creates an addictive cycle, to your point, that if something feels really good, it's also the feeling you get when you Usually I say sink a basketball shot, but I think you guys are all more familiar with sinking a goal in soccer or making a block or stealing the ball. Um, one of my kids is just starting to play soccer and 
it's the feeling that they get when they uh, go all the way down the pitch without anyone getting it from them and use some of their moves. Feels really good, um, but you have to keep doing it. And you create pathways in your brain based on the things that you have a dopamine response to. This is just a little map kind of showing where those neuroreceptors live in your brains. And if you've heard things about like, you know, cannabis gives people the munchies, that's because we have neuroreceptors for THC in the parts of our brain that control hunger. Um, it makes, it uh, impairs motor coordination. Does anyone have a way of saying that that is more simplified than impairing motor coordination? Impaired motor coordination means your body doesn't move the way that you are telling it to move with your brain. You break down the system of how your brain is controlling the way that your body moves. It impairs memory. It affects how we record memories, how we sense time passing. All of those um, abilities are in different parts of our brain. And if there's a neuroreceptor for THC, when you use cannabis, it's going to change the way the part of that part of your brain works. So they're all over. Here's a big map. Now, THC is, uh, and cannabis is tricky, right? Like it's legal in Washington state. Washington voters voted to make it legal. There's stores that you can buy it in, um, but it's illegal to sell it to people who are under 21. And that's because there's much more risk for cannabis use for people whose brains are still developing. Brain development actually goes up till age 25 or more. So if I was making the rules, I would say, let's not have cannabis available to people under 25. But the reason it's more risky for people whose brains are developing is if you can imagine, has anyone ever worked with clay before, right? So if the clay has already been shaped and then hardened, you can't really do much to it when you touch it and poke it, it's a hard thing. But if the clay is still soft, if you're still making the sculpture, you know, making whatever you're making and you poke it then, you're having influence on it, you're changing how it develops. Uh, and so what we've found with, ex with THC exposure, um, you know, a lot of medical studies, right, are done on animals. So in this case, they've done um, studies where they've administered THC to rats, and they find that the rats who are exposed to THC, their brains look different and an MRI, and they have um, impaired development. They can't basically for rats, it's going through mazes. They can't go through the mazes as well as rats who haven't had that exposures. But unfortunately, we also see this if you do MRIs of young adults who've used cannabis as they're growing up. And you can actually see differences in the brain development um, from young people who have used cannabis and young people who haven't. So if you remember this, like we have all these receptors all over our brain and we actually see that it seems like stimulating those receptors has changed how the brain has developed. A lot of the science around cannabis is really, really new and really developing because it's been this thing that was illegal for so long. And there's always, um, or quite typically, it's hard to get funding to research things when it's legal. A lot less people use it. Um, in the case of THC, there's been a ton of stigma around cannabis and people who use cannabis, right? So we haven't invested in finding out what the impact is, even if a lot of that stigma is based on things that aren't even true. Um, so we know this, science, this kind of biological science that it looks like THC use changes brain development, but you could say that happens, and what does that even mean? Uh, is, it, is it so bad to change brain development? Well, some of the things that we know just from behaviors around THC exposure is that if you have this um, really high-powered way of do having dopamine drop in your brain and near your body, you get used to it over time. We're going to talk about what addiction is. I'm so glad you brought that up early because the idea, has anyone heard of the idea of tolerance before? Like maybe... Um, you know, a certain amount of chocolate cake feels good the first time you eat it, but then the next time you want two slices of chocolate cake to like have the same feeling. So that's kind of a tolerance effect. So we do see in some cases that it looks like people who used THC, especially as they're growing up, um, that other things don't feel as good. Like getting a soccer goal does not feel as good because you've been using this extremely high powered way of dropping dopamine. And then there's also findings that people lose their interests in other things. Um, 
because there's this you know, instant chemical way to change how your brain is working rather than going out and meeting up with friends. Uh, you know, when I came in here, you all were on your phones doing things you enjoy, right? Um, and, and talking with each other. And there's some indication that you know, part of what's called cannabis use disorder or in a very extreme form addiction can take away joy from other activities. Okay, so what does that mean like, um, you know, what are the risks here? We talked about what that could mean biologically and from a behavior standpoint. Um, but what we see with THC, and you'll notice that in a lot of these slides I use the word shows a link to. Have you guys, uh, any of you taken a science class where you might have talked about the difference between a correlation and a causation? Are those familiar terms? Would anyone want to explain? I thought I saw one head nod. Is there a bold person who wants to explain the difference? I can. It's my job, too. <laughs> but if somebody else wants to, they can. Um, so correlation means we see one thing happen when we see the other thing happen. Causation means the same thing, but in causation, there's a bunch of other proof that we've been able to make a link. We can definitely say, oh, we see the mechanism by which this happens, then this happens. We know that this always happens first and this always happens second. Essentially, causation is a very, very strong scientific test, whereas correlation is a bit of a weaker scientific test. And a lot of the science around THC is in that what's called correlation or linked because we haven't had the opportunity to study. We haven't known. Like cannabis use has been something that people keep secret and that you can't um, get uh, funding to do studies on. So a lot of my slides are going to talk about a link or a correlation, and some will talk about causation as well. Um, so there's a very clear link between young people who are using cannabis and learning and memory impairment. You know, So this is measured both in terms of like um, taking a memory test and seeing what people can remember. And you know, if we looked at those parts of the brain that THC affects, it's the amygdala, things that make memories. So you're like, well, that makes a lot of sense. But the thing about THC is unlike other drugs, it's fat soluble, not water soluble. Water's always moving through our bodies. So water soluble substances get out of our bodies pretty quickly. Fat soluble substances stay put a little longer, um, up to a couple weeks. Um, and so what we've found with THC is that uh, when people are using THC, there's learning and memory impairment when they're, you know, when they would say they're actively feeling the effects of THC, but then also weeks later, you can still see that impairment, which was really fascinating to folks until they figured out actually like the THC is still in your body being stored in fat and, re, you know, still having an effect. And because of this prolonged use, we see a link between poor academic outcomes uh, and THC use. And then if you look at a pattern of use, those poor academic outcomes um, can decrease graduation rates. And there's even an association between people who used cannabis frequently when they were younger end up, um, it's linked to having lower earning potential as an adult or not being employed as an adult because of those missed opportunities while people were in school. And that doesn't mean that that's going to be true for everybody, but that's a real risk because it's, you know, it's your brain that's affected by THC. And then um, talking about addiction and mental health, which I link together because addiction, while well, addiction has physical effects as well, addiction is a, is a mental health um, condition too. So there's links and even causative links to mental health disorders. Um, you know, we'll talk a little bit later in this presentation about, you know, that some young people and even older people say that they use cannabis to feel better if they're depressed, but there's actually a really strong link that kind of looks like um, cannabis and depression kind of chase each other in a circle. Because if you are feeling down, that dopamine hit, right? But then it goes away and you actually feel even worse than you felt in the first place. So we see a lot of young people um, who are struggling with mental health as a result of cannabis or getting in that, that cycle. Uh, unfortunately, there's a close relationship between some psychotic disorders and psychotic symptoms and cannabis use, especially with really strong cannabis use. So I'll talk about high potency products. Uh, but we know from talking with, um, do you guys know what Harborview is? The big hospital, the trauma hospital in Seattle. Um, and I've talked to doctors over there who Young people have come in having had used high potency cannabis 
uh, and they've had a psychotic break. So they're seeing and hearing things that are not there. They're hallucinating right there and not being able to tell reality. And in part, that's because there's products out there now that have so much THC in them that our brains just can't handle them. Um, and psychiatric disorders are more common among people who have like a family history or a family risk. It even looks like if someone might have had that risk already, using THC has the onset happen sooner. Cannabis use disorder, which I'll talk about another in a minute, and also the, the use of drugs, other drugs and tobacco as well. And it, you know, that, that one um, is an interesting one that people don't have all the answers to. And one part of the answer seems to be that uh, cannabis impairs your decision making. And I'll talk about it on the next slide a little too, but people do some pretty harmful things when they are not, you know, when that part of their brain that usually helps them weigh, like, what's real? What's going to be a good idea? What am I going to feel about later? Um, that's some pretty, they can make some pretty bad choices, including use of other drugs. Um, so talking about cannabis use disorder. So we used to call things drug addiction in a medical statement, a medical way. Um, and then kind of the whole medical field backed up and said, like, let's be much more specific about what do we mean by becoming addicted to something and, and acknowledge the fact that, well, addiction might be a very extreme condition where you experience withdrawal, where it feels really bad all the time to not have something. There's also other shades of addiction or use disorder. And a recent um, survey of adults in Washington, not young people, but among adults in Washington who report using cannabis found that one in five of them had some level of addiction to cannabis. So this is one thing, like before there was a legal market, you might have heard like, oh no, like cannabis is not addictive, marijuana is not addictive. It definitely is, um, especially with the high potency products in our market. Um, and people are learning that, you know, not by meaning to learn that. Um, as adults who think that it's a safe product that doesn't have an addictive component. So what do we mean when we talk about addiction? We mean using more than intended. Um, so you might just, be, you know, for somebody thinking like, oh, I have it really under control. I don't use this one. I don't want to. One sign of addiction is using it more than intended. Wanting to stop using and not being able to. Spending a lot of time using it. Like remember, I also talked about one of these behaviors of giving up other things that you used to enjoy. To, so there are people who, who give up things that they enjoy because they end up spending more time using cannabis or using the thing that they're addicted to, having cravings for it, um, experiencing harm from it, and we'll talk some more about other potential harms, and continuing to use, missing important activities, using in high-risk situations like driving or being in a car with someone who's using it needing to use more and experiencing withdrawal. Withdrawal is a physical condition of like, I, like I feel sick if I'm not having this condition. So all of these things are possible um, with cannabis and people didn't really, you know, we had this myth for a long time that that was not possible. So then looking to the injury and trauma risk, trauma um, means, you know, things that have a dramatic effect on your body or your brain. Unfortunately, we see um, overdose injuries so another myth about cannabis is you can't overdose on it. It's true that cannabis is not lethal as an overdose, so there's no lethal um, things. But that doesn't mean that lots of young people in Seattle at Harborview have not been hospitalized, because uh, it does, it messes you up, <laughs> um, to put it really, really quickly. And also, with now that we have a legal market, we've seen a lot of very young children access cannabis products um, and go into respiratory distress, so have trouble breathing, and need to go to the hospital there. There's also a condition, I put vomiting here, the fancy term for that is hyperemesis syndrome. So um, you have probably heard that marijuana or cannabis can have medicinal uses as well, like there's medical marijuana. And one of those medical uses is for folks who have diseases and conditions where they've completely lost their appetite to the degree they're not eating and that's really harmful for their health. And because there's these endocannabinoid receptors in the parts of the brain controlling appetite, THC can help people with those very terminal conditions regain their appetite. But there's this interesting thing that if you overstimulate those receptors, you can also get to a point where your body, your brain just thinks you need to vomit continuously. So there's been cases of what's called hyperemesis syndrome um, where people cannot stop throwing up after using cannabis. And then unfortunately, for me, this is one of the hardest pieces of my job is the um, number of motor vehicle crashes and other traumatic injuries that are linked to cannabis use. 
we've really seen, you can see I put a headline here, like where pot became legal, car crash deaths rose. Um, there's also other traumatic injuries that don't involve vehicles, but ve vehicle crashes really stand out. Um, even here in King County, we've seen many more than I would want to of lethalities that involve cannabis. And, and you know, we hear, do you guys, you all have probably taken the Healthy Use Survey. Do you ever take the survey in school where it asks you about a bunch of health behaviors? Does that sound familiar at all to some people? That's where a lot of our data is from. And we do see that a lot of teens say that um, they would get into a car with someone who'd been using cannabis. So that's one thing we're trying to work on is to, to have alternatives to that and to let folks know it, it's really not safe. So this part is probably gonna be the least relevant to you all because this is a part of my presentation where I usually tell adults and parents what like the data around youth cannabis is, but this is the part where you all know a lot more than I do um, because you're teenagers in King County. So I'll go through my data, but then if folks wanna share things they've seen or questions you have, um, we can have those conversations too. Okay. So overall, um, about one in 10 10th graders in King County report that they've used cannabis. The funny thing about this is that when, if you ask 10th graders how many people use cannabis, they think it's about half of people or even more than that. But it's really about maybe one in 10 who ever used cannabis in the last month. So it's not that many. For me, as a public health person, I want it to be lower than that, obviously. Um, I talked about that mental health link. So we do see more use among students who report feeling sad or hopeless, who have C's or lower grades, students who are LGBTQ+. Seattle tends to have a higher rate of use and then students with multiple racial or ethnic identities. And some of those things like the LGB, LGBTQ plus youth and youth of multiple racial and ethnic identities are also youth who report stress. Like it can be stressful not being sure where you belong or feeling that people might judge you. And so that probably again connects to, to the mental health piece too. Um, some good news is that cannabis use among teens in King County has been dropping since 2012, even with the opening of the market. I think part of that too is when cannabis became legal was when we finally, we started to fund prevention programs in a lot bigger way, which is kind of funny that we have this legal market. Um, but we're also doing a lot more prevention work than we used to. We started to see things bump up a little bit, then COVID happened and use went way, 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 way down. Do you have a guess why use probably went really went down for teenagers during COVID? They couldn't share it. What's that? They couldn't share it. They couldn't, sorry? Share it. Yeah, they couldn't share it. There's nowhere to get it. Um, I call, in science, we call this a natural experiment. It means something happened, like a condition drastically changes and you can see an outcome, but it's not because you did it deliberately. Um, yeah, people couldn't get cannabis. That's right. Um, you know, and so I, I say like, certainly we don't want to repeat COVID, but you know, um, that was certainly a way that reduced cannabis use. Um, other substance uses have also decreased over the same time. One thing that's kind of interesting and concerning is that almost for as long as we've collected data, people who identify as male have reported using more cannabis than people who identify as female. Uh, and that, has, that gap has closed. So it's now about the same use rates. And even in sometimes we see that it's higher among people who identify as female. Um, so trying to figure out why is that happening? And yeah, there could be lots of different reasons. Okay. When we talk to young people, this is what we hear, that um, when they think about their peers or uh, themselves using cannabis, some of it is around having fun or being in a particular social scene and having this idea that it's, you know, it'll be fun to do. And we did talk about like that is literally the parts of your brain that it affects is this reward pathway, right? But then also to cope and escape, um, dealing with depression or dealing with a family issue and you know, as an adult whose job is public health, that's obviously hard to see because we know that if youth had other resources in their lives that could support them in those moments, then cannabis wouldn't be the choice that it was. Like it's hard and we've done 
lots of talking to different young people, um, you know, and heard stories of like, well, I used to go and do things after school, and then my family couldn't afford to do things after school anymore, and so then I just started using cannabis instead. And we're like, oh my God, like, we're not doing the right thing if that's the options that youth in our communities have, right? Um, this is the information you all know, probably. Uh, but from our surveys that um, this youth have access to cannabis, this is what people, other youth that I have met with have told me that I need to tell adults that don't imagine um, that, you know, this is not something that's a real threat to people in school. This is something um, people tell, you know, tell us that they can get it from friends, some unknown way, or paying somebody for it, or an older sibling from the home or going into a store. And the stores are ID limited, so presumably with a fake ID there. Actually, I'm gonna take a pause for any questions that might be building here. Okay, so my question is, so say like I'm around like maybe 30 years old, it doesn't even have to be youth, and I'm using it, and I have a child. What are the effects on this children, like this child? Is yeah. there like effects on it, or just like cannabis doesn't have an effect on the child? And um, so, there's different ways to use cannabis, right? And mm -hmm. some of them can create a secondhand effect. So vaping or smoking around a kid or around anybody else. No, but like yeah. say before even the secondhand smoke, like as he's like, you know, as people come out, they come out with like some type mm -hmm. of like, oh, they may have like, not like, I wouldn't say like a, like, they, like they're not fully capable. They may have like some type of, I don't know how to put it, like some so type of disease about, like, or something that starts up with them. Yeah. Oh, okay. Someone For someone pregnant. who's pregnant. So THC passes, because it is fat soluble. So PHC, THC can pass from a pregnant person to a fetus. Um, we're learning about what that means. So there's some kind of, you know, low birth weight is a concern with, with um, babies. You want them to be healthy and very chubby. Uh, and we see a connection between low birth weight and cannabis use. Um, it can also pass through breast milk. And so we do see, you know, I talked about those like studies showing brain changes. So depending on the degree of exposure. And, okay. you know, and I think there's also this um, cannabis, you know, THC is impairing and the choices a person makes. And when you're a parent, I'm a parent, you're responsible for another little person uh, and thinking through how you're keeping a home safe for that person. And we have, I took it out of these slides, but the number of cases um, of very young children finding cannabis and eating, and a lot of it looks, it's, you know, they look like candies, they're edibles. Um, and so we do have quite a lot of young people showing up to the emergency room or calling the Washington Poison Center because of THC. Okay, which thank can you. Which be really scary, yeah. Ponderance. Tetrahydrocannabinol. All right, and the tetra speaks to like how many hydrogens are attached. It's a molecule. It's describing a molecule. Yeah. What if you like don't directly smoke? It? So secondhand cannabis smoke is the same as secondhand. You know, so they're smoking. I didn't even talk about like, you know, smoking things is not good for you. You're all athletes, right? <laughs> We've got that. Um, and cannabis smoke has a lot of the same things that cigarette smoke has in it, or even just like it's inhaling smoke from a fire, right? Like you wouldn't want to be around a campfire every day or when we have um, the wildfire smoke drifting in during the summers. Um, but then the THC is also in the smoke. So, you know, we've had people be like, well, can I, I I'm the driver, but somebody else, you know, but I'm not smoking cannabis is just in the car and it's like oh that's not how that works like it is in the smoke too so okay well i'm going to share so like i said i did po i do policy work through a large degree um and so here are some of the things that i'm currently watching in the cannabis market because they're they're creating an even bigger public health effect um, than the legalization of cannabis. And, you know, I think probably all of you know one of the big driving factors in legalizing cannabis in Washington State. Because there was a hugely disparate arrest rate, right? Like a lot of people, especially black people, native people, and Latinx people were being arrested, even though the use of cannabis um, before it was legal and even now is the same among basically most 
different races and ethnicities, but it, but the illegality of cannabis was really being used as a tool to incarcerate people along racist lines. So it was a remedy to that. But then now we have a for-profit market and we need to look at remedies in that market too. So here are some things that I'm watching. Um, so now that we have a legal market, there's a lot more business to be had in cannabis. Um, and that's, you know, the farms that are growing the cannabis that, you know, in Washington state, we have the farms that are growing the cannabis. We have the factories that are turning it into usable products. And then we have the stores that are selling it. And those are kind of the three types of businesses in our market. And, um, who's taken an economics course or a business course or anything like that? Yeah. What can you imagine might happen if you say, here's this new product. What do people try to do in business? What's like one way to succeed in business? Advertising. Advertising, yep, which is a concern. Now, that's on my next slide too. But also you try to come up with a unique product, right? You try to say like, I can make this and nobody else can make it like I can make it. And one of the ways that um, the cannabis business, different that those people who are making the products have tried to differentiate is to say, we can make really, really high potency products. So I talked about like cannabis is a plant. Um, and THC is a chemical in that plant, but you can concentrate, you can take the chemical out of the plant and concentrate it, concentrate it, concentrate it, concentrate it, um, until instead of maybe, you know, in the plant itself, the highest you can get for THC is like 25 to 30%. But this like gel looking product here on the right in that red is like an 80 to 90% product. So just, this is the type of product where when we talk to the neurologists at Harborview, people are coming in and it's like they have a brain injury um, because they're using, you know, especially like if folks have never used THC before and they use a high potency product and it just overrides everything um, in their brain. That's not a medical term, overrides everything, but it really messes them up for a bit. Um, now on the, the, some products in Washington state have a limit to how much THC can be inside, so the edible products actually have a limit, but all these other products have no limit. And people, we found when we talk to adults, when we talk to young people, people don't really understand what THC means. And so you're, you know, you have, and we don't really have good warning labels on these products. Um, and we also know that a lot of those factors of addiction that I spoke about in the mental health we spoke about are much more likely to happen with a higher potency product. Uh, so there's a bunch of folks in Washington working for ways to say like, hey, maybe we just cap the potency and you shouldn't make products that are just like the strongest they can possibly be. Or maybe we need better warning labels on these products so that you know the adults who are buying them can be like, oh, this product is gonna be really different than this product. And especially if a young person is in contact with one of those products, they will understand that it's a far more dangerous product um, than a much more low and lower potency product. And unfortunately we do, have youth telling us in our health surveys that they're shifting to more of the concentrated products because they're cooler. They're like in fancy packaging and they're really well designed. Um, so that's one thing that we're working, working on. And most of the laws around cannabis are made in the state by the state legislature. We're not allowed to make a lot of rules at the local level. The state has take has that power. So I have here on my slides that there was a move to, you know, regulate potency in some way in the last legislative session. It didn't go forward, but if you follow the legislative session, which I'm not blaming any of you if you don't, but if you do, you'll probably see more potency. This might be an item you wanna look at, and I can follow up when the bills drop if you wanna see what people say about them. Okay, and then the other thing that I'm really tracking um, is for some products, what the labels look like, and there's a lot of rules in Washington state about a cannabis product and what it can look like and specifically how it is not supposed to be appealing to young people, to teens. Do you know who wrote these rules? Adults. And they talked to nobody who was <coughs> actually a young person or a teenager. So um, our program worked with Washington State University and some other partners to uh, talk to young people and say like when we you know all these packages like this package here on this slide that package follows the rules for not being appealing to young people yet when we talked to young people about that package 
Um, they said, this is annoying. It's not for adults. Like, this, this kind of design um, is not something that adults find attractive. This is what young people want to find attractive. Um, and, that, you know, there's kind of a flaw in our system where we're having only adults make the determination of what's appealing. And we had other packages in the study and heard things from people of, like, I would ha put this in my, I would take pictures of myself with this and put it on my Instagram. I would have pictures of this product on my wall. And it was like, how are, how are these the products we're selling? Like, how is this the packaging we're selling in Washington State? And we also found, you know, that the warnings that are on the packaging are not very helpful to people. Um, and that people just, just didn't understand like what THC was or how much was in a serving um, and overall found these things kind of attractive. So that was a really big finding for, uh, not, well, we kind of thought it would be that way, but the Liquor and Cannabis Board is the state agency in Washington State that takes the laws that the legislature passes and figures out how to make them into implementable rules. So like the state legislature might say, cannabis packaging cannot be appealing to youth. And then the Liquor and Cannabis Board has a bunch of hearings and people from the industry come in and people from public health come in and they write rules that say things like, okay, and this is literally what the rules are. You can't have bubble letters <laughs> is one of the rules. Um, you can't have animals who are anthropomorphic, so animals who are acting like humans. You can't show actual kids or teenagers on a package. So those are kind of what the rules look like and yet still we have a package that looks like this. So it's, it's really powerful that um, teens actually could tell us what they found attractive and the Liquor and Cannabis Board just says, yeah, I think we should change those rules. Um, and I'll be happy to share with your group information about when they do that because I think teens need to be part of shaping those rules. Okay, well this part, I think you all probably are better experts than I am, um, but you really have and you probably know this, um, as, are you guys teammates with each other? Or do you play on different teams or teammates with each other? Okay, awesome. Well, they play on the same team and some others play on a different team. Okay, okay. Um, so you know that your classmates and your peers have influence on you. And we often hear about peer pressure in this way of like, someone's doing something unhealthy and then they pressure other people to do it. But peer pressure goes all around, all the other ways too, like you can, set an example or invite people into a healthy um, lifestyle too. And you know the science of public health has shown us that talking to peers and classmates about why you're not using cannabis like helps people make up their mind not to use cannabis. Doing things where there isn't cannabis around or having specific, like well, soccer being an awesome example of that. Um, doing activities that don't involve using cannabis or other substances. Also, you know, and this, I think this is the hardest part, um, is reaching out to friends who are not doing well, because we know there's that connection between when you're not feeling well, when your mental health is not good, you look for ways to feel better. Um, and sometimes it can be really hard to talk to a friend who you know is not doing well, but that could be a difference for them of making a healthy choice of how they deal with that experience or making an unhealthy choice. There's some, I'll send these slides, there's some tool, you know, some campaigns that you could check out if you wanted to. Um, I don't know, are there things? Oh. Has anyone heard of TeenLink? Is that a resource you've ever heard of before? Yeah, so TeenLink is a helpline that's staffed by young people. And it's for young people, and when you call, you talk to a young pe person who's volunteering there. Um, so it's a really great resource for talking to someone who might know more what's going on. Parents can use it too, and caring adults can use it too to try to connect, help for a young person. We also in Washington have a toll-free line um, for people who are experiencing substance use in the Washington Recovery Helpline. So these are some pretty good resources that, you know, in that case where you have a friend but you don't really know how to talk to them or you don't know what you can offer them, Teen Link is a place to go and talk about how to help a friend um, or to give that friend that number to call. And often I have things that have the Teen Link brand on them, but I don't have them with me tonight. Um, questions? And like I said, how to help peers and teens prevent harm from cannabis is probably something you all know more about than I do. So if folks have ideas and want to share those, I'm curious. So you can share them with each other or have questions. 
Um, one surprising part is um, the difference of how the cannabis went totally down during COVID and how the, the difference in male and female would be because I wouldn't think there would be a difference, but as nowadays, there really isn't much of a difference. Yeah, and that's really interesting too. And that data is healthy use survey data. Like I said, that survey, if any of you can think of having to take it at school, the next, actually everyone, you might have just done a healthy use survey because it was fall of this year. Um, so we'll find out in a, you know, when we get that data, because it does take a while. When you all take surveys, health surveys in school, it actually takes a long time to what's called clean the data. So figure out if it's like trustworthy data and then to analyze the data. So I won't get to see the information probably for like another month or two, which is kind of silly, but that's the way it goes. And then we'll say, know what happened after COVID when maybe people did, were able to get it from friends again. Um, yeah. Well, thank you all for taking time to see this material. And my email is on things. If you have questions about cannabis, like I said, you all know things that I do not know. Um, and we are always eager to, to hear what young people are actually experiencing in King County. So you can email me. Um, we occasionally have internships and things like that. If you're like, you know what? Public health and use substance use is something that really interests me. Um, I'll keep you all updated. So, thanks. <laughs>